Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again. Thank you for bringing us all safe and sound this morning. And as we're going to listen to your word, Lord, speak to us. Help us to be present with your word. We praise you for all the good things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. This morning, the sermon topic is going to be about three steps to heaven. All right. The t- sermon topic is going to be about three steps to heaven. All right. I want you to imagine, everyone, imagine there is a highway road that leads to heaven. All right. A highway road that leads to heaven. And you get to travel before going to heaven. Let's say, what are the possibilities that we can go to heaven with our modern technology right now? All right. Well, let's go here and try to understand what can we go about or what can we do about how to get to heaven. All right. Let's see. Uh, Here is a super fast car that we have here. Well, that can actually go about 400 miles per hour. And that's very fast for me to understand that. And that's a sports car, and it can can travel like miles per hour. And you can reach moon if you travel about 400 miles per hour in 20 months. And that's speaking about constant driving. About 20 months, you'll reach moon. All right, ready for that journey? All right, and the next one, (laughs) here's a super fast train. It's called a bullet train, and that can travel about 500 miles per hour, or even sometimes it goes even 563 miles per hour, and that can go very fast as well. And if you want to reach the sun, well, you can actually reach the sun um, if you drive about for about 25 years from now on. If you start today, for the next 25 years, you'll be traveling in the train and a speed of about 500 miles per hour. And that's speaking nonstop driving. Wow. Can you imagine that? <laughs> All right, the other one is the, this Airbus. Well, you can actually fly in that Airbus for about 700 miles per hour, and you'll reach the nearest fixed star in the universe about 400 years. So I was researching this morning. So it takes about 400 years to even go to the nearest star if you want to go on this Airbus. But if you take a jet plane, it's a different thing. But you'll still need to travel at least 100 years if you go on a jet plane. That fa- travels about 4,000 miles per hour. Well, there are fastest transportation modes that you can go, but this is just speaking about the starry heavens. But there is something beyond the starry heavens. Jesus is not in the starry heavens where the sun, moon, and stars are. And that's where we can go further rest. We can't go any further than that. The Bible mentions who will not go to heaven. Oh boy. Is it a good news or a bad news? I'll, go with, I'll begin with the bad news. How about that? And then I'll bring the good news. The Bible says who will not go to heaven. Maybe I'll turn off the light. Okay. This one, Uncle? Is that better now? All right. Somewhat better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about who will not inherit the heaven. Because the Bible says nothing bad is going to happen to them. The saints will be safe and sound, right? The Bible mentions in Isaiah 59 verse 2, sin separates us from God. And the Bible also mentions in Galatians, if you go with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5, The Bible mentions who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. I'm not going to read all of that, but I'm just going to hit the main highlights. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, the Bible mentions, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. The list is there, all right? And then the Bible mentions in the verse 21, after all the mentioning about the works of the flesh, the Bible says, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Murderers, drunkenness, envy, strife, murder. So it's all about a nutshell, sin, right? All this is nutshell and sin. Adultery, witchcraft, lasciviousness, uncleanliness. So anything that breaks, anybody who breaks the law of God, sin separates them and they won't inherit the kingdom of God. All right then, who will inherit the kingdom of God? 
All right, that's the message this morning. The Bible mentions uh, we are, I mean, God is beyond the starry heavens. Uh, the verse is down here. But the Bible mentions that God is beyond the starry heavens. Paul said, I know a man in Christ. Don't ask me who is he, but I know a man in Christ. Such a one is caught up to the third heaven. So Jesus is not in the starry heavens. The first heaven is where the atmosphere is, where the birds fly, the sky, and everything. The second heaven is where sun, moon, and stars are. The third heaven is where God himself dwells. So we can even go there. The furthest a man can go to the nearest fixed star, or they can go to the land of moon and then come back. So most of the times they don't come back. But <laughs> that's all they can go to do. But Jesus is beyond, the Father is beyond the star is heaven. How can anyone go there? Well, that's the question we're going to learn today. All right? Three steps that we can go to heaven. And how do we prepare ourselves that we can be there in heaven? Amen? All right. Who can go there? I was asking this question. Who can go to heaven? All right. The Bible says people who are having freedom from sin. That's the only answer. All right? People who are having freedom from sin. Revelation mentions about that very clearly. Revelation 7, 9 says, Behold, Before the Lamb, clothed in the white raiment. So which means people who want to go to heaven, they'll be pure before God. They'll having white raiment, pure, sinless, right? Those are the only people who will be going to heaven. It says, clothed with the white robes and palms in their hands. Spur of Prophecy mentions Enoch in heaven is right now having a white robes and a palm in his hand, which simply means he had victory over sin and he is actually in a safe place. Amen? We want to be there as well. How many of you want to go there? I want to be there, right? With all my heart, I want to be with Jesus, right? Not about the place. I want to be with the person whom I love the most, right? So let's talk about how can we be there. All right. There are like three steps that I'm going to talk to you about. Very simple three steps. Not a rocket science, very simple steps. How can we go to heaven, all right? The giant step that we all need to have is to our sins to be forgiven. That's a giant step. The number one step is our sins should be forgiven before going to heaven. But there are conditions how God forgives our sin, all right? And we're going to see that. How does God forgive our sin? All right? Very simple message. How does God forgive our sins? There are three conditions on this one giant step. All right? This is a very simple message. So no need to think to panic. All right? All right. Three simple steps. But the first step has three conditions. Is that, is that simple so far? All right. Number one is repentance condition. That's number two is confession and number three is restitution, all right? We're going to talk about three simple conditions, and the second step and the third step, and the sermon will be over, all right? All right, very simple. All right, let's talk about this giant step. How can we really know that my sin is completely forgiven by the God who is so pure and holy? All right, how can I understand that? All right, repentance is the number one step that we need to talk about. If you look at the entire New Testament from the book of Matthew, all the way to the book of Revelation, there is one key word that keep on repeats. From the time of John the Baptist, all the way to the book of Revelation, there is one key word that keep on repeats and repeats and repeats. It's like a theme of the book of New Testament. If you look at the very first person, John the Baptist, all right? John the Baptist mentions, he mentions repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's John the Baptist. And then we see Jesus mentions repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then we have another person comes in the picture, Paul, uh, Peter afterwards. So Peter comes in the picture and he says in Acts 2.38, repent. He says, repent thee therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So we see John the Baptist, that's the first ministry, and he's preparing the way for the Lord. 
and then Jesus comes in the picture. He does his ministry. And then Paul comes and he does his ministry. How about the next person? Who is in the line? So we, Paul is the next person in the line, right? Who writes half of the New Testament. So he comes and he tells about, about his message at the times of ignorance God winked at. But it says, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So we see John the Baptist and we see Jesus and we see Peter's ministry and we see Paul's ministry wherever he went, whether the first missionary journey, second, third, or even fourth missionary journey, wherever he went, the number one cry that he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. How about a church for love this year? The Bible says in Revelation 3.19, Revelation 3, verse 19, especially for the Love Edition church members, the Bible mentions, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, the Bible says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So we started from the first book of the New Testament, and it, there are so many other verses as well, but I'm just giving the main verses. We see the theme Let's keep on repeating, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, which means Jesus is going to come soon. So what is it all about? What is repentance in a nutshell, right? This is the condition and this is the definition for repentance. Repentance simply means what? Includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it. We all know we have heard it several times, but we need to really apply this today. Right? Repentance simply means feeling sorrow for your sin and turning it from away. That's the key definition for repentance. Right? Feeling sorry for what you did rather than feeling sorry for the consequences. Right? Feeling sorry for what you did. That's what the Bible says. There are two kinds of sorrows the Bible talks about. One is godly sorrow and the other one is worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, whereas the worldly sorrow leads to death. There are several examples in the Bible. Godly sorrow, one of the classic examples is Psalm chapter 51, where David mentions, Create in me a clean heart, O God. If we go to the book of Psalm 51, uh, look at how David brings up his message. Psalm chapter 51 Psalm 51, he mentions like this. How, if you look at all the starting of every verses that you see, Psalm 51, verse 1, have mercy on me. Verse 2, it says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities. And verse 3 mentions, for I acknowledge my transgression. And verse 4, against thee, thee alone. And then he mentions, he does not, he does not say, God He's not justifying his sin. He simply says, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. And that's what he mentions. And verse 7, it says, purge me with hyssop. And then he mentions verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. And verse 9, hide thy face from my sin. And verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. And then he mentions in verse 11, cast me not away from your presence. Restore unto me the joy of the salvation. So he keep on, he keep on mentions, he's not, he's not justifying his sin. God, like Eve or Adam, Adam did, uh, when Adam sinned, he blamed on Eve. When Eve, when God talked with Eve, Eve blamed on the serpent. I wouldn't have done this if you would have not created the devil. Well, on the other hand, David simply acknowledges, God, I'm sorry for what I did. That's repentance. Amen? If you have done anything wrong, if I've done anything, anything wrong, let's repent and say, God, I'm sorry for what I did, rather than giving excuses or justifying our sins. Uh, my, my student came up to me and said, Sir, I'm sorry I cheated in my exam. But if you did not give us a pop quiz, I wouldn't have copied. Well, <laughs> well that's not what it is, right? You, you did your mistake. You should have simply said, I'm sorry. There is no buts and ands, right? 
Simply say, God, I'm sorry for what I did. That's repentance. Feeling sorry for what you did and turning away from it. And by the way, most of this materials I've taken from Joe Cruz. There's a book called Three Steps for Heaven. But I also personalized this message to myself. So it's dear to my heart. So I want to give credit to him as well. All right. So that's part one. Repentance is feeling sorry for your sin. But the worldly sin is like Esau. Remember Esau? He sold his birthright, but he was crying in the bitter tears. But he was crying not because he lost his blessing, because he want material properties. My friends, don't worry about consequences. Consequences will be there. David cried not for, uh, not for God to remove his consequences, but he cried, God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. His main goal for God to have mercy on him, right? Well, that's the first step, repentance. All right, first condition for God to forgive your sins. It is God who actually leads you to repent, amen? God is the one who tells you, hey, you need to repent, buddy. You need to repent for your sins. He leads you to repentance. It is God's goodness that leads us to repentance, amen? That's the first condition. What about the second condition? The second condition is confession. It says, whosoever confesses their sins, them shall have mercy. What does confession mean? How do you confess? Do you simply pray and ask God to forgive you? Yes, that's one way. But let's ask more definitely. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Confession is, if you've done something wrong with someone else, go to him whether publicly or privately, all right? Ask, tell your confession to God or to your man. Let's ask the Bible. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, and let's read verse chapter 3 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 13. Why do we need to confess? What does the Bible talks about confession? What is the reason? Of course, the Bible says we will have mercy while we confess, Let's ask more about it, right? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible mentions Jeremiah 3, 13, and then we'll read Leviticus 5, 5 as well. So Jeremiah 3, 13 says, Only acknowledge thine iniquity that you have transgressed against thy God. And then it says in verse 15, And I will give you pastors according to my heart, and will feed you with the knowledge and understanding. The Bible says, only acknowledge your iniquity. And then God says in verse 14 and 15, I'll give you pastors according to mine heart, and I'll feed you with knowledge and understanding. So when we acknowledge our sins, healing will come to us. Amen? Healing will come to us. My friends, confession is a very hard thing to do. If you, have done, if you have done against God, sometimes it's easy for us to just confess to God, right? How about confessing to our friends? Maybe we have hurted their reputations. Maybe we have hurted their feelings. Maybe we have done something wrong. You can't ask God to forgive what you have done to your neighbors. You have to go to your neighbor and ask them sorry. No buts, no ands. Tell them, I'm sorry. I know how you felt. Tell them straightforward and tell your mistakes. My friends, this is a big, giant step for God to forgive you. And that's the number one step for us to go to heaven. And if we, if we have something against someone else, today is the day for us to go to them and reconcile. Reconcile. I called my friend... Um, I actually stole a pencil box when I was in a school, when I was a schoolboy, uh, let's say about 20 years ago. No, 25 years ago, long, long ago. So <laughs> I called him and I said, hey, f my friend, his name is Nabil. I called him and I said, would you please forgive me? For what? I took your pencil box. Please forgive me. I wanted to, so I wanted to apologize to you. It's like, forget it, move on. I know, but it's, it's, it's a little thing for you, but it was convicting my heart that I should ask you for confession openly. And I didn't, ask, I didn't say anything against him. 
I took it because I didn't have pencil. No, I said to them straight away, I'm sorry I did this. Please forgive me. My friends, we need to reconcile. If we have hurt at someone's reputation, go to them personally, privately, talk to them. Because confession will bring healing. Could we, could we generalize a confession? Uncle, I'm sorry for what I did. Well, for what? Right? <laughs> Let's ask the Bible. Let's ask the Bible. Should we generalize our confession? Let's ask the Bible. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5. Let's see what the Bible says about uh, confession. Should we generalize a confession or should we more be specific in what we do? Leviticus 5, 5, the Bible says, Amen? All right. The Bible says, and it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has done in that thing. All right. Which means if you have done something on that thing, a specific thing, well, I have stole the box. Please forgive me. That is specific. Right. I'm not going to simply say, my friend, sorry for all the mistake that I did. What? What mistakes? Tell me what it is. I'm sorry that I did this particular mistake. That's what the Bible says. If you have to confess in the Old Testament time, bringing a lamb or a goat or a bull, whatever, you bring it to the priest, you have to confess specifically of what sin you did. Well, that's comforting, right? No. <laughs> uh, for me, it was really hard, right? We can't do that, my friends, but confession will bring healing. Because repentance is a gift from God, and God will lead you to repentance. And because you repented of your sin, God will ask you to confess it. Because confession will bring healing. Amen? Amen? No amens? <laughs> and it's like a little hard. I'm stepping on your toes. But my friends, let's do that. Because that's the number one giant step for us to get to heaven. The condition number one, repentance. Condition number two, confession. And then the Bible does not end there in Proverbs 28, 13. I actually put some ellipses for a reason. All right, let's look at the third uh, a condition for sins forgiven. But before the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness let's go to god whatever you're having if it is a private sin to god confess it to him if it is a public sin against your neighbor confess it to your neighbors that's what the bible says in matthew 5 if you bring your gifts to your god and if you find any sin in there go back and confess and then do what come and offer your blessings to god so that's Condition number two for giant step number one. And this one here, the third condition for your sins to be forgiven is this. The Bible says, whosoever confess it, that's the second condition that we read, and forsake. What is that? Yes, we need to confess. That's right. What does that mean to forsake? All right. Forsake them, then we shall have mercy. All right. Mercy, pardon, and we'll have uh, peace of mind. How, what does that mean to forsake? All right, forsake, in other words, simply means restitution. I asked my friend to forgive me, but I also told him that please send me your address. I want to send you some money. It might not be much. It's just like $2. But still, I want to send it to you <laughs> because I took your pencil box, and that's the worth of the pencil box. I want to send it back to you. Well, I'm sure that you won't remember everything in your life, right? From your day of birth all the way now. You won't remember everything, but ask God, God, is there something that is really daunting on me, that is really bothering my life, bothering my spiritual life, that I should get rid of it? So forsaking simply means making restitution. That's what it is all about, making restitution for the past thing that you have done. It's not just uh, some, you stole some money from someone, 
And then if you really ask him sorry, it's a good thing, but pay him back the money that you stole from him. Amen? That's restitution. That's called forsaking your sins altogether. God wants us not only to confess our sins, but also forsake it. Amen? I'm going to give an example with my dad. My dad uh, hired a contractor. I was in a college at that point of time in India. So my dad called this building contractor. He built, this, he built a wonderful house for us. Uh, for me, I really enjoy the house where I live in India. It's a little house, and I liked it. Uh, but my dad promised that he would give this much of money to this building contractor. And then the month passed by. My dad did not pay him the money. Like I said, I asked my dad that I overheard your phone call. You promised him that you're going to give him 6,000 rupees, which is $100 equivalent. Why don't you give him? It's about one month's salary. My dad said, no, you don't know anything about it. Just go to your room. Like, <laughs> uh, you need to understand that there are so many cracks in the home. I need to repair it. Dad, at least give him a little portion. Give him something. You don't have to just wipe out everything. And my dad was like very upset with me. And then one year later, my dad passed away. I said like, okay. And I can't find him. And I came to this place and I came here. I'm doing my ministry here. I can't find that guy. I want to pay him back. I want to pay him the hundred dollars that I, my dad stole it. I want to do it. But I couldn't find him. What am I supposed to do at that point of time? I want to ask him sorry. I want to pay him the money back. In that case, Spirit of Prophecy mentions your only choice, your only duty to do is to depend on the merits of Christ. You can't do anything about it. You can't find that man. You can't understand where he is in a big country like India. So what you can do is, the only thing you can do is give it to God in an offering way. And I was asking God, God, I want to give it to you, but not as a normal offering, but this should be something special. So I prayed about it. So God gave me this idea, why don't you print Great Controversy book in Tamil? And there it is. So here's some pictures that I'm longing to show all of you, <laughs> right? So I sent $100 to a pastor in India, and I said, I want, to bring, I want to print some Great Controversy book. How much will it cost? Well, he said about $2,000. Well, I don't have that much money. Well, I have $100. And Auntie Valerie heard about my plans, and uh, I know Dixfield Church gave me the Christmas money. And then I sent the money, and then we printed about 1,000 great controversy books, all that started from the restitution plan. Right, man? And then we printed about 1,000 copies, and we, we gave all the church members, and all, we started like a, a big revival in India, and we gave about 1,000 books to a lot of people. Not only uh, great controversy, we also gave, there are some people, Mostly like 90% in India, women can't read. They can't read. They can understand. My mom can't read. And <laughs> there's no point of giving a great controversy. So what we did is we gave her some audio Bible. Well, they can listen to audio Bible. That's what we did. All started from the restitution plan. <laughs> Amen? So, oh, boy, my mask broke. <laughs> All right. All right. You need to get a new mask for me. <laughs> All right. So I hope you understood the plan, right? So all set from restitution plan, and we are distributing great controversy, those who can read, and we're also giving some audio Bible in Tamil, those who can't read. So this is how that I want to do restitution when my father stole the money. I'm not proud of it, but God did something good, even amidst among all these trials. Amen? Thank you, Sister Sheila. <laughs> All right. All right. Step number two. What is the first step? Giant step is asking for forgiveness. There are three conditions of forgiveness. Repentance, confession, confession and restitution. It's a, restitution is the hardest one, really. I can't understand that. It's the hardest process to do. It's a very excruciating pain for me to call someone and say, I stole your pencil box. I want to give the money back. Well, that's a hard one to do, but we have to do that. The Bible says those who want to have mercy have to confess and to forsake. Amen? 
So that's step number one. Step number two is not a big one, but it is a big giant step as well to do. There is no conditions for that. Straightforward message. Amen. All right. Step number two is born of spirit. Born of spirit. Well, you might be baptized, but the doctrinal teachings in the church, you have to go through immersion. You have to follow the protocol. Everything is very mandatory, right? I know several people in my country have been baptized, 20 people, 40 people were baptized and they left the church. Like, what's the problem? Because many people got baptized because a pastor might come from a foreign country and uh, they'll give money to get baptized. I'm like, what is happening here? I've seen that in my own eyes. I'm not proud of it, but that's what it is. So that's been not the true way to do it, right? So born of spirit is not just getting into the water and dumping yourself. There are so many uh, dried sinners go into the water and come out as wet sinners. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about born of spirit really have a deep conviction when you have been baptized. Amen? So, born of spirit, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm sure everybody's born again. But how about being born every day? We need to be born of God every day. We need to have the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit every morning. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it's good to have the doctrinal knowledge in our hearts. But what is more important is to have a heart religion than to have our head religion, right? I was reading something about recently. It's only about 18 inches from the heart, from the head to the heart. But we have a lot of head knowledge, but it's very hard to experience it with our heart knowledge. My friends, the saddest thing is we need to have a heart religion with Jesus every day. Desire of Ages, page 373, mentions that the Pharisees and Sadducees believed having a religion of head or religion of head knowledge constituted righteousness, but that's not the truth. Having a head knowledge is not going to have righteousness, but having a heart religion constitute righteousness. That's in Desire of Ages, page 373. My friends, let's have a heart religion rather than having a head religion. Amen? So be born of the Spirit, which means having the fruit of the Spirit in our life every morning and throughout the day, in the church, in the board meetings, and in the prayer meetings, everything. Amen? Born of Spirit is what we need in our life. That's the second step, having the fruits of the Spirit in our life. And the Bible mentions in John 1, 12, as many as received Him, to them he gave them power to become sons and daughters of God. How do we receive Jesus? By receiving his word. Every morning. Having baptism of the Holy Spirit every morning. And then let's go to the giant step three. The first step is what? First step is sins forgiven, right? And three conditions are repentance, confession, and restitution. Step number two, born of spirit, right? And last step, is sanctification a big word oh, for me it's like oh wow what's that big word let me give it in a nutshell what is the definition of sanctification right this is the definition of sanctification loving obedience to god's revealed will is that simple when god says something do it it's because you love god isn't that simple all right it's all about simple Obedience, loving obedience to God's revealed will. That's, that's what it means, sanctification is. Having obedience to God's word because you love him. Right? Not picking and choosing it, but all of it. Amen? That's, that's what the Bible says. Not just the, not just the Bible alone, along with the spirit of prophecy. Right? So not just following what you like, but doing what God revealed you to do. Amen? That's giant step number three. The Bible says in Hebrews, let's read that verse. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5 verse 9. Let's see what the Bible says in Hebrews 5, 9. 
And those who don't have Bible, you can take one from the pew, or you can just look at here. The Bible says in Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, right? Well, that's called imputed righteousness. God gives you free gift for your past sins. He just allows you to be perfect because he took your sins and he gave you victory. And he made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. First, he makes you perfect. And then he gives you strength to be obedient. Amen? God wants us to do that as well. He wants us to obey all of his word. All of his word. We have our head religion, but does that travel to your heart religion as well? Because the Bible says, no one enters into, in the kingdom of God, anything that defiles. Because sin is a transgression of God. So how do we have a victory over the sins that we are having today? How many of you have little sins? You don't need to raise your hands, please. How many of you have shortcomings? We all have shortcomings, right? We all have all kind of shortcomings. Let's tackle them today, all right? With four verses. Let's tackle them and then finish the sermon. Is that okay? Just four verses. And let's tackle the little sins that we all have. Little sins that pulls us away. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12, this is what the Bible says in Hebrews, uh, in verse... Uh, 12, sorry, 12.1. 12, yeah, the Bible says in 12.1 of Hebrews, Wherefore, seeing we also compass about with so great a clouds of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. Which means there are some cherished darling sin that we cannot let it go of easily, right? So the Bible says, let us lay aside. How do we do that? Well, that's the... That's what we're going to do, it. all right? Let's claim the victory over all the sin or one sin that easily beset us. It was one sin that kicked out Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. It was one sin that kept away Moses from entering into the promised land. It could be one sin can keep us away from heaven. We don't want to do that, right? Let us overcome, even if it's a little shortcomings, a white lies. People say, eh, a little white lies is not a problem. No, it is a problem because no liars can go into the heaven, all right? So God wants us to overcome all of it, amen? So four little, four little verses, how do we claim? I'm not talking about, okay, let's, talk, let's bring a judge, okay? Let's bring an attorney and say, if he's going to judge us, we'll all be free to go right? Nobody has, nobody has done any crime. Nobody has done any murder, violence, or traffic rules. You're all free to go. That's what he would judge you. How about let's bring Jesus here and the Father here to judge us. Will we go free? If God judges us today, can we be free from all our sins today? That's what the verse is, right? How can we be free from all the sins. Today we read in Sabbath school, be he clean who bear the vessels of the Lord. How about that? How can we be clean? All right, four verses. All right, how to claim victory. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Another one broke. All right. All right. I need to pray for this one too. All right. How do we claim giants? All right. Step number three, how do we really overcome or how do we have victory over those giant steps, all right? Or to have sanctification. All right, verse number one. How do we claim the victory? It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Let's read this verse together. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I may not pronounce this word properly, but God gives us victory. But how? Right? He wants us to understand that he gives us victory. I'm exempted today from wearing the mask. All right. So God gives us victory, right? So how do we claim the victory? How do we get it? How do we know that this victory belongs to me? How do I understand that? All right. Let's ask the Bible. That's verse number one. Claim these verses. Go on your knees 
Do not come out of your prayer closet until you get that one victory over that one particular sin. Don't pray for 10 sins at a time. Just pray for the one thing that is cherished, darling sin that you are suffering and handling with. Just go on your knees. Don't come out of the prayer closet until you have the victory. Amen? Because that one thing can lead you away from Christ. So let's, ask, let's go on your knees. Claim the Bible promise. God, you told us you'll give us victory over this one particular thing. And you ask God's blessing. The Bible says in Matthew 11, 7, 7 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give you good gifts to them that ask him? Ask for the victory that you wanted specifically. Not for any kind of victory. Specifically ask him, God, I have a problem in that one particular area. Please give me victory. I had a study contact in Turner. Her name is Nina Jo that I'm studying with. About 10 weeks. She smokes a lot. And she is also marijuana. She is marijuana and all. You name it, she had it. So I went to her and talked with her about it. I gave her a verse in the Bible. I gave her Philippians 2.13. I want you to memorize it, and I want you to use this Bible verse as a magneting power or dynamite verse to break your sins. She said, okay, I'll do that. And I also told her to drink kale juice every morning and also told her to drink. I'm not saying that just claim the Bible promise and don't give her health tips. No, I'm not doing that. I told her to drink kale juice every morning. I told her to eat a lot of broccoli and, so, and a lot of vegetables. She went home, and she came back next week, and she said, Stephen, I have a good news for you. What is it? I drank the disgusting juice that you told me to drink, <laughs> the kale juice every morning and every evening. I drank that kale juice. I hated it with all of my heart, but guess what I did? I stopped smoking for a whole week. Like, praise God. And then it's about a one month now, she never touched a cigarette. Amen. I was like, praise the Lord. That is like, sister, thank you. That's like so amazing that how God blessed you. And then I said, continue drinking kale juice. And that will help you. And she's keep on drinking it. And she's eating a lot of vegetables. My friends, do something that God will give you victory. Philippians 2.13 says, this is what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 2. The Bible mentions for if somebody... The Bible says in Philippians 2.13, For it is God which giveth a worketh in you, both to will and to, to do his good pleasure. So God gives you the will, that's your desire, and gives the do power, that is ability. So he gives you the will, the desire to, I told her, pray that God gives you the desire to hate smoking, and ask God to give you the desire to hate it, not only hate it, but also give you the ability to hate it. And she did. God gave her the ability. God gave the desire. And she, she said today, I don't have any desire to smoke at all. And if anybody spokes to me in front of me, I just walk away. Doesn't bothers me at all. So like she's been smoking for 20, 30 years. And she gave up altogether by the power of God's word. Amen? Amen? So that's how God can do for you, my friends. God can give me victory, and he gives you victory as well. I fixed it. All right. Let's go to the third verse, third uh, promise. All right. The Bible says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to the dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does that mean? Likewise, reckon ye also yourself. What is it what reckon means? Reckon simply means count it as it is done. There is no reservation. Well, Nina said to me, I told her, don't even keep any cigarettes in your home. Well, I might have one for future one. She didn't tell me that. She had no reservation for a future smoking. She did not have that. She get rid of it altogether. That's what reckon means. And there's another verse says, but 
foot ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't make any provision. Why? Because when you make provision, it's going to fulfill your lust. Let me give an example. A mother was talking with a little boy. Let's name him Johnny, all right? Johnny, where you go? Where are you going right now? I'm just going out to play, mommy. I said, like, okay, Johnny. So Johnny went outside, and then he came back in the evening, and then mom saw, Johnny, I told you not to go swimming today. It's dangerous. I've told you before. Uh, Johnny said, Mom, I was tempted. Okay. But I saw you this morning. You were having your bathing suits or swimming suits in your bag. Why is that? Johnny said, Mom, I expected to be tempted. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't tell all that excuses, right? Don't make an excuse or exception for sins. That's what it means, right? Make no provision. That's what the Bible says. I just have one marijuana pocket in my bag. Well, for the future, no, make no provision, right? If something is troubling you, you have to get rid of it altogether. No, uh, maybe, future, nothing like that, right? Not like Johnny, expect to be tempted. No, <laughs> let's not expect anything to be tempted. Amen, my friends? These are the four, three simple steps for us to understand. All right, let's just review it. The first step, sins to be forgiven. Three conditions, right? God wants us to repent, which is turning away from your sin and feeling sorry for it, right? That's first condition for uh, sins to be forgiven. And confession. Confess to God publicly or privately or to your friends publicly or privately. Confession will bring you healing. And be specific when we do that. And then condition number three, restitution. Ask God today, God, tell me, is there something that I need to make it right? That I should make it right with you or with my friends? Please let me know. If you stole offerings or monies in the past, which you do not give to God, God, help me to convict me. What am I supposed to do? Please help me. Help me to restitute it, right? That's, I'm not talking about uh, from the day one that you were born. No, whatever God just puts in your mind, just do that, right? I'm sure there's a lot we have done, but I'm not asking everything, whatever God convicts you. Ask him, God, tell me what am I supposed to do? And then step number two, born of spirit. Holy Spirit should be impressing your heart. This is the way, go in it. This is the way, don't go in it. Ask the Holy Spirit to be helping you to be born of the Holy Spirit every single day. Only when we're born of the Holy Spirit, we can be there with Jesus. Amen? We can have that love, joy, peace, temperance, long-suffering, gentleness, every traits of character of the Spirit when we are born of the Spirit. Amen? And then the next one, we'll have a new life with Jesus. The last one is sanctification. Loving obedience to God's revealed will to you whatever god tells you to do do it because you love him you're glad you came this morning to the church amen. amen three simple steps that god wants you to practice it sometimes well even if you forget the protocol it's okay just kneel down and ask god's blessing right sometimes we don't have to go exactly step one step two step three well if you if you do it it's great if you don't do it Ask God to help you to do it. Amen. And God bless you as you contemplate on this message. How can we be with him today? I want to be with him. How about you, my friends? Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord. Thank you for helping us to understand the ways that we can be there with you, Lord. Please forgive our sins, and we have sinned against you and you alone. And may we have mercy, mercy for all of our sins, Lord. And please help us to repent and confess and help us to restitute if there's anything that we are hanging on to our life and help us to be born of the Spirit every day that we could be reflecting your characters to others. And please to show us the right path. And we want to claim 
the promises that you have promised that ask it shall be given unto you. What, Lord, we want a holy life. Help us to live a holy life every day. Help us not to make any provision for lust or for future provision for our flesh, Father. Help us to all live. Help us to, we are, you called us to bear the vessels, but help us to be clean before you. Give us the will, give us the desire to hate sin and give us the ability to overcome all the sins by your grace alone. Be with us. If anyone is struggling amidst among us with shortcomings, trials, errors, or whatever it is, help us to keep looking to you for motivation and for encouragement and give us the greatest desire that we could all be like you and give us the ability to do, be like you, Lord. Bless us and guide us. Thank you for so much for hearing and answering our prayers. We pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.